for joining us in our second session of our special cannabis webinar series. With us here remotely is Dr. Francesca De Pola, who will be presenting on cannabis current medical guidance. But before I get started, we're just going to go over a few housekeeping slides as per usual. This webinar is being live tweeted on Twitter, and you can follow us at PS Quit Smoking or use the hashtag TeachWebinar to post or read questions. Here's a biography of our faculty presenter, Dr. Francesca DePola. She is a staff physician and teacher. She works in the addiction medicine program at CAMH and is a medical lead in the inpatient medical withdrawal unit. She is also a faculty member in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Dr. De Pola has no faculty, financial, or conflict of interest disclosures to declare. And these materials, as well as the verbal presentations and any discussions, set out only general principles, and they do not replace the need for clinical assessment or treatment plans by healthcare professionals. So with that, I will leave it to Dr. Deopola to take it away. Thank you and enjoy everyone. Hi everyone. So this is my first time doing a webinar. So, and um, there's 301 attendees right now. So what I'm gonna ask is that um, we maybe have time for questions at the end. <clears throat> so just keep typing away your questions, but we'll get to them at the end. Um, so the objectives for this webinar are to describe the current lower risk cannabis use guidelines that we have, some screening tools that we can use to identify problematic cannabis use, and interventions and treatments for cannabis use disorder. Oh, wrong one. So the, the Canadian Medical Association um, recommends a public health approach to cannabis legalization, which as we know now, cannabis is now legal. So they ask that we take an approach that helps prevent uh, dependence and addiction, and that increases the availability of resources for people if they um, understand that their use has become problematic, and also the safety for those who want to practice harm reduction. And in 2017, um, so June last year, they publicly support, supported the release of Canada's lower risk cannabis use guidelines. So I'm gonna go through these guidelines. So this is a list of, there's, there's 10 guidelines, um, and this is the list. I'm gonna go through them one by one. So the first recommendation is abstinence. So what they're basically saying is that the most effective way to avoid any harms from cannabis use is to be abstinent. Um, but those who do wish to use, um, that they recognize that there is the risk of harm, um, both health, harm to their health and uh, social outcomes, adverse social outcomes. And that this will, um, that risk will vary from person to person. It can be a bit difficult to predict sometimes who will have more harm than others. Um, and that uh, patterns, product qualities, these kind of variables uh, will also impact the harm. The second recommendation is about the age of initial use. So what we do know is that the earlier that you initiate cannabis use, particularly if you initiate in your teenage years, the more likely that you will have adverse effects. And this, if we think about the developing brain, our brains are actually not fully developed till the age of 24. So if you imagine starting as a teenager, the, the impact on your developing brain is going to be a lot more, even than starting in your 20s, early 20s. So <clears throat> any messages that we get, so when we're counseling patients about the use of cannabis, we should really emphasize this piece around the, the age of initial use because I think that a lot of harms can be mitigated if people are able to start use at a slightly older age um, once we understand that the brain is fully developed. And that the purpose of, of all of these lower risk um, guidelines is to provide us with a dialogue for discussing cannabis with patients. 
So it's not just about identifying problematic use, but it's how do we get comfortable with having a discourse with our patients around cannabis use, the way that we can probably, most of us can talk fairly comfortably now, now around how people use alcohol, and we're fairly comfortable with sort of helping people understand what's harmful and what's not. The purpose of these guidelines is to help us be able to do the same for cannabis use. The next two recommendations come uh, are related to the choice of cannabis products. So the, the higher the THC content, um, those are generally associated with higher the adverse outcomes. The THC content is considered to be sort of the more addictive part. Um, the part that activates the cannabinoid 1 receptors. Um, and so the, basically the higher the ratio of THC, the more likely that you might run into problems with um, aberrant use and also um, just adverse outcomes in terms of health and social consequences. And then the recommendation number four, um, they indicate that synthetic cannabinoids certainly um, seem to have a much more acute and severe adverse health effects, um, including death. And so they're saying that these products should be avoided. So try and avoid um, products with a really high THC content and avoid the synthetic cannabinoids. And then the next two recommendations are about methods and practice. So recommendation number five is that um, that the inhalation of combusted cannabis adversely affects respiratory health, com health outcomes. Um, so it's generally preferable to avoid routes of administration that avoid smoked cannabis. So by using um, vaporizers or edibles, this will help reduce the risk. Um, however, there's a delayed onset of psychoactive effects. Um, so there's, there's adverse effects from using um, non-inhaled products as well in the sense of sometimes the, the pattern of how it affects you is difficult to predict um, and people might actually take more than they intend to. So it's, it's understanding how the different methods incur sort of different risks. And then recommendation um, number six is an avoidance one again similar to recommendation number four. So people should avoid practices that involve deep inhalation, breath holding, <clears throat> excuse me, and to avoid psychoactive ingredient absorption when smoking cannabis, because this disproportionately increases the intake of toxic material into the pulmonary system. Recommendation number seven is about frequency and intensity of use. So it's strongly, Daily or near daily use is strongly associated with higher risk of adverse health outcomes. So um, users are encouraged to be aware and vigilant um, to keep their own cannabis use occasional. So similar to what we would say about alcohol, um, we always uh, advocate for people to have at least one alcohol-free day a week. So similar with cannabis, we really urge people to try and avoid uh, develop, developing a pattern of daily use and for them to try and reduce the frequency of use throughout the week. And recommendation number eight is about cannabis use and driving, which I know there's a lot of focus on. So driving while impaired from cannabis is associated with an increased risk of involvement in MVAs, which won't surprise anybody. So it is categorically recommended that people refrain from driving, using any machinery, for at least six hours after cannabis. And it may need to be longer depending on the user and the properties of the specific product. Um, the use of both cannabis and alcohol results in multiple increased impairment. So if you're going to use cannabis combined with another product, then I don't think truly we can say that we know for sure that six hours is okay. Um, and I would urge people to probably have at least 24 hours if they're going to be combining substances. And related to the cannabis use and driving, the Ministry of Transportation have changed the requirement, um, certainly for physicians, when it comes to, and I believe nurse practitioners, when it comes to a duty to report. 
So it used to be that if you had a substance, um, a medical condition that may um, cause harm when driving, then we were required to report. The, the criteria now is a little bit more specific. So people have to have a diagnosis of, of uh, substance use disorder and it's uncontrolled. So I would say moderate to severe and also untreated. So if somebody's not being compliant with treatment recommendations. I think that piece is quite important to remember um, because if somebody is, is um, engaged in treatment and has uh, a goal that's consistent with them being healthy, um, then I think that that would mean that we, might have, we may not have to have the same obligation to report. But it's something that should be monitored on an ongoing basis as well. Recommendation number nine is um, special risk populations. So there are some probably populations that are considered to be at higher risk and who should refrain from using cannabis. So people with a first degree family history of psychosis or substance use disorders, pregnant women. Um, and some of this is based on precautionary principles. Um, but I would recommend that this be something that's certainly part of the dialogue whenever you're counseling uh, patients and um, educating them about risk. And then recommendation number 10 um, is that if you're going to be combining some of the risk behaviors listed above, so combination of risks basically makes the cannabis use higher risk. So preventing these combined high-risk patterns should be avoided by the user. I'm also going to just review the guidelines. Um, so the College of Family Physicians, they've had guidelines out for a few years, but it's related to medical marijuana. Um, so they authorize, they have guidelines or recommendations around authorizing dried cannabis for chronic pain or anxiety. So what they're saying is that there's, there's a number of recommendations. Um, they say that there's no evidence to support the use of dry cannabis as a treatment for pain conditions like fibromyalgia or lower back pain. So the only um, pain condition currently that we understand that cannabis use is help, that dry cannabis use is helpful for right now is neuropathic pain. And that they ask that um, there should be all other standard treatment should be exhausted before you would actually try cannabis, or at least it be used in combination with those other treatments. And then recommendation number two is if you're considering authorizing dry cannabis for treatment of neuropathic pain, as I said, there should be an adequate trial and um, use of pharmaceutical cannabinoids, so nabilone, products like nabilone, before you would use dry cannabis. So there are a couple of absolute contraindications. Um, so right now, we don't have evidence to show that it's helpful for anxiety or insomnia. And we would say that it's not appropriate um, for medical treatment for those who are under the age of 25. Like is said in the lower cannabis use guidelines, people with a family history of psychosis, people who actually have cannabis use disorder or another substance use disorder, cardiovascular or respiratory disease um, that's impairing function and a pregnancy. And then relative contraindications are people who have a mood or anxiety disorder, tobacco use disorder, risk factors for cardiovascular disease, um, and people who are heavy users of alcohol or sedating substances like opioids or benzodiazepines. Um, so recommendations seven, eight, and nine are related to assessment and monitoring. Um, so physicians should assess and monitor all patients for potential misuse. So similar to prescribing somebody opiates, the idea of having a contract for the risk of the client to be taking this medication to be assessed on an ongoing basis, um, that you should have a contract that includes a pain assessment that's been done. Um, assessing for anxiety and mood disorders that would make the use higher risk, and a screening and assessing patients for substance use disorders. And then recommendation number nine is about the patient should regularly monitor 
as I said, they should regularly monitor the treatment and make sure that the benefits outweigh the risks on an ongoing basis. And 10 and 11 are about reducing harm. So patients, again, this is a recommendation around driving. So they're saying at least eight hours after inhalation or oral ingestion. So the oral ingestion can have a sort of variable uh, duration of effect. And recommendation number 11, when authorizing dry cannabis therapy for a patient, the physician should advise the patient of harm reduction strategies. So those would be strategies that are in the lower cannabis use guidelines. 12 and 13 are about communication with patients. So when you're, um, some patients might actually want this and you don't feel that it's therapeutic. So they, rec they talk about using neutral language speaking from evidence, um, objective information. And lastly, number four is about dosing. So they basically talk about starting low and going slow. Um, and physicians should try and specify the percentage of THC on the medical document. Um, just as they would specify dosing for another analgesic, recognizing that the THC part is the, um, is the part that's considered to be more addictive. And I can see there's already a lot of questions, and I, I will try and get to them at the end. These are some links around uh, the use of, of medical cannabis. So in terms of screening tools, um, there's a screening tool that you can use that is just a general screening tool for any substance. It's, a, it's a, related to the CAGE uh, screening tool for alcohol. So you can use this for cannabis. Um, Try to cut down, got annoyed or criticized, felt guilty. Um, have you ever had a drink or used drugs just first thing in the morning? So you can apply all these to cannabis. And if somebody has a score of one or more, then that certainly prompts further assessment. Um, and then there's also a questionnaire um, called the CAST questionnaire, and there's quite a lot of uh, research or review about this in Europe. So they have six questions. Um, they talk about, how, ask if you've smoked before noon, using it alone, so cognitive impairment as a result, family or friends express concern, tried to reduce and not been able to, and then has cannabis actually caused you problems socially, uh, functionally at school or at work? So if there's two or more responses to this, then that would um, make you think that there may be a question that they have problematic use. So as I said, this um, was looked at by the European Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction, and that they suggested the use of this screening tool. So, uh, several studies that have been done in Europe have investigated the association between CAS and other components relating to the subject and the social and family environment. And what they found was that problematic cannabis use is positive related to other use of other substances, truancy from school, poor performance, and gambling for money. And that if there's higher self-esteem and satisfaction with health status, this seems to be protective. And I, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the DSM-5 criteria. This is just a review slide. So um, if you score six or more, this is considered to be severe. Uh, four or five is moderate. And um, if you have um, two or three, then that's considered to be mild. So I'm just bringing in a case study to this. This is a, a patient that I followed um, he's still a patient of mine. He's been a patient of mine for about five years. Um, he started using cannabis when he was 12. I started seeing him when he was 23. His use was daily, virtually from the outset. He had concurrent generalized anxiety disorder, didn't really want to be taking medication, had more confidence in cannabis working. I started seeing him at the time that his opiate use disorder was treated, which has been in remission with Suboxone. By the time I started seeing him, he was using up to three grams a day, and he was using it via bong or a pipe. And the thing that sort of prompted him to come to treatment was that he was experiencing cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. 
Um, so that is cyclical vomiting, nausea, um, abdominal cramps, usually associated with withdrawal, but for him it could also happen during intoxication. And he would describe having to have a hot shower to relieve his symptoms. His goal for cannabis use was to be abstinent. So in terms of interventions and treatment, there's been a lot of um, research looking at that there's been several randomized controlled trials looking at cognitive behavioral therapies. So there was a review of, um, of this in 2017 of the RCTs that have been done, and they found that brief interventions are helpful for mild to moderate cannabis use disorder. So brief cognitive behavioral interventions, either in person or online, appear to be helpful. Um, when they looked at not, it being not brief but more prolonged, there actually didn't seem to be much added benefit in there being sort of more prolonged um, interventions. The other thing that, that can be used for the treatment of cannabis use disorder is pharmacotherapy. There's no overwhelming, like, one pharmacotherapy that works. People have sort of thought about it along the lines of substitution treatment the way we do for opiate use disorder. So the two that have been looked at are Navalone and Nabixamol. Navalone has, there's been some studies on this, and it has shown that it can definitely help with cannabis withdrawal, so irritability, sleep disruption, anorexia. And there may be some evidence showing that it can help reduce cannabis relapse. I would say in my own experience, it works better if people's goal is abstinence. If they're trying to cut down, I find that using that one in conjunction with cutting down doesn't seem to work so well. It is useful in terms of the urine drug is test is negative, so you can actually monitor to see if they're able to maintain abstinence. And the other one that's uh, there's been research done on is called Nabixamol. This is an extract of cannabis, so it actually has the potential for more psychoactive effects than Navalone. It's currently administered in a spray. The urine drug screen isn't, it's not as useful a test, and it's a bit cost prohibitive right now, but the studies seem to show that it's actually quite effective. The only problem is that there's more potential for misuse with it. So the client that I was following, in the past five years, he's actually managed to have some periods of remission. Both of these periods um, came from being in an inpatient setting, medical or non-medical, just to break the cycle of his use. And then it was followed by Navalone for a period of two or three months um, for the withdrawal and his cravings. He didn't actually participate in any cognitive behavioral therapy. However, his religious beliefs were very important um, in motivating him to be abstinent. And his sy symptoms of cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome resolved as soon as he stopped using cannabis. So that's me at the end of the didactic. So, and these are some references. So um, you can take questions. Stephanie, are there, are there, I haven't actually looked through the questions as they've been coming in in great detail, are there, there themes to the questions that I could answer rather than every individual one? Hi, Dr. Tapola. Yeah, so I made note of some questions here. If you want, I can just read them and you can answer. Okay. So um, we have um, a participant who said that Nabilone is being used successfully for PTSD nightmares. The generalization that all synthetic uh, cannabinoids should be avoided as it may cause problems for physicians prescribing. May you please comment on this statement? So yeah, I, there is some research showing that um, Nabilone can be useful for PTSD-related sleep disturbance, so nightmares. It's not overwhelming evidence, but you're right, there is some evidence. I think that... Um, the second part of your question, I wouldn't say that I avoid it. 
I think it's always about balancing risks and benefits and making sure that you educate the patient um, that right now we don't understand everything that there is to understand about the use of cannabis or synthetic cannabinoids. And so I would, if you're doing something that is somewhat experimental, and I, I just build in that this is a trial. So it's like a trial like any other treatment. We're going to try it and see if it works and make sure that you actually um, have regular check-ins to make sure the intervention is working. I think if you can show evidence that it's helpful, that it's enhancing people's clinical and functional stability, that's the way I would frame it when I'm documenting my rationale for using it as a treatment and, and for continuing it as a treatment. Thank you. So we have another question here. Will the LRCUG guideline number nine recommend no cannabis use for women who are breastfeeding? Um, I think at the moment, yes, that would be the recommendation. I'm just going to go back to the slide. Um, I would say yes, because I, I believe it could potentially cause harm to the newborn if you're breastfeeding, or at least that we don't we don't know enough to say it's okay. So Mad is recommending waiting at least four hours after using cannabis. Is there a reason that the recommendations are different from the Kim H six hours? Um, who's recommending four hours? Sorry. Um, Matt, Mothers Against Drunk Driving? I'm not sure. Um, I would say that the, there has been this four to six hour window. I think that four hours has been talked about and I think six hours is now considered to be safer. Um, so it's possible the MAD guidelines may not be quite in sync with the CAMH lower uh, risk guidelines. I'm not 100% certain, but certainly if, if I was advising a patient, I would be saying six hours. Thank you. And we have a case study here. So yep. we had someone have a 23-year-old male who died um, from a heart attack related to cannabis. Um, they first started using cannabis at age 14, and they were diagnosed with schizophrenia, and they also co-used alcohol and tobacco. May you please comment on whether this is normal and your perspective on this case? Um, when you say normal, which part do you mean? Sorry. Uh, maybe if the participant who asked the question can specify on the chat box, that would be great. So death at age 23, is this abnormal? Is the death at age 23 abnormal? I mean, I think this particular client sounds very high risk. So they have concurrent substance use disorder and schizophrenia. And I think you said they started using at age 12, which makes their use a lot higher risk. I don't, I'm not sure how I would say normal, abnormal. I, I think that death from cannabis is possible. I think the more risk factors that you have in place, the higher that risk. That risk. Um, if this client was on antipsychotic medications, that would have potentially given them metabolic risk factors for cardiovascular disease, which could have made the cannabis use higher risk in terms of their cardiovascular health. So I don't know all the facts of the case. It does sound like a very high risk client. So the higher the risk of the client, I think the more likely that you're going to have adverse outcomes, including death. How accessible is it for a patient to obtain a medical cannabis use prescription? Do they need to be referred to a cannabis medical doctor as they would need to any specialist? So my understanding is that you don't have to be a specialist um, in order to complete a medical form. I can post on the website. Um, some of those links actually had links to a sample medical form. I don't think that you need to see a specialist, a family doctor who has an interest in pain management um, or who's been following the patient for a while. Uh, 
would, would be able to um, complete this medical form. But if you're not sure, I think it's totally reasonable for the client to be referred to a specialist. Um, that's my understanding. I think when you're, when you're looking at using um, medical marijuana for pain, I think it's really important to understand or at least have some kind of pain consult to help you understand what kind of pain you're treating and to be able to sort of do a thorough assessment of the patient in terms of risk factors as well. So just a follow-up to that question, we have another participant who asked um, whether nurse practitioner online services for prescribing cannabis is leg legitimate to do it online. So I don't know the answer to that, <laughs> and I can find out for you. I will find out, and I'll, I'll arrange with Stephanie to put that information um, out there. I, just from the question, I think the idea of doing it online makes it a little bit higher risk. Like You really have to make sure that you've done a really robust assessment of the client before you make the decision to prescribe it. And I'm not sure about nurse practitioners being able to do it. Do you mind commenting on what the recommended level of THC is and what is considered high THC content? So I, I think the lower the THC, the better. Um, I don't know that we can say what, that there's a percentage that we try and aim below. I will see if the, I, I did look in the literature to see if I could be more specific about that and I couldn't find anything, but I will look I'll, I will look um, again, and I'll ask some of my colleagues, and I'll see. I think it's just a general principle of the lower the THC, the better. The THC part is the part that um, tends to be more problematic because of the psychoactive effect. So I'll see if I can get more um, anecdotal information from colleagues around that. What are the conclusive long-term social and health effects of cannabis as research has been limited? Um, you mean what can we conclude based on the limited research that we have so far? Yes, I think that is um, the question. Um, so I think that we can look at it the same way as we would look at adverse um, social outcomes or adverse outcomes from other substances, I think that there's, I'm trying to work out how to answer that question the best way. I think that cannabis should be viewed through the same lens as any other substance, like the way we view alcohol and the potential for adverse outcomes socially, um, including um, the risk of harm to others, the risk of death, the risk of loss of employment. Um, I think these are all possibilities with cannabis use. What are your thoughts on the negative outcomes in society of using cannabis in three years from now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in terms of are we going to have more negative effects because it's become legalized? Is that uh, if the participant who asked the question minds clarifying, oh, I see them typing here. Yes. Yes. Um, so, I mean, it's difficult to predict. My own personal belief is that legalizing cannabis is actually a step in the direction of us understanding cannabis better. I think that now that it's legalized, it has a much higher profile. Employers are starting to look at you know, urine drug screening people and actually holding them accountable to their cannabis use, whereas previously that might not even have been part of the dialogue. So I think it's possible in three years' time, because we're going to develop a better understanding, there's likely going to be more research done in it, we will actually be able to provide patients with a much better informed um, narrative around it. And I'm hopeful that might actually help reduce adverse outcomes. I don't know if that will happen within a three-year time frame or if it's going to take longer, but, but I, I view cannabis legalization as being the start of this journey. It's not the end point, it's the start point. 
Thank you for your thoughtful response. So from a point of view of documenting inhaled cannabis for estimating exposure levels, similar to first or second hand exposure, what evidence or recommendations can we refer to document the impact of smoking cannabis on lung health? Would there be a difference of harms from oil versus smoking dry cannabis leaves? Um, I think that there is more harm from smoking dry cannabis leaves than oil um, in terms of respiratory health. Um, I'm not sure if I can give you more specific information around how we would measure. Um, so when people come in for respiratory or, sorry, um, tobacco assessments, there is a measurement that we can do, I believe, for carbon monoxide levels. Um, you could do something similar for cannabis use if people are smoking it. Uh, so basically what you're trying to do is measure the toxins associated with the cannabis use. But I don't know if I can give you more specific information than that. And that's, that's another um, topic to see if we can get more information from the, our library. Can you please speak to the documentation of treating a patient for reducing risk of cannabis and the relationship with health and life insurance and or PCP and MTO reporting? Okay, so, so say that question again. Yeah, for sure. Can you speak to the documentation of treating a patient for reducing risk of cannabis and the relationship with health and life insurance and or PCP and MTO reporting? So is this for people you've identified who have cannabis use with cannabis use disorder, or is it more just generally how do we document conversations about cannabis use, including assessments for cannabis use disorder? Is that Maybe you could speak to both, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, again, this is an evolving um, area, and I, I would say to you that if I was asked to do this presentation in six months' time, it would probably be slightly different. We are going to be learning more and more about this as we go along. Um, I think that if I was taking a history of for cannabis use, I would be very specific about how much the patient's actually saying they're using and their pattern of use. And then I would refer to the lower risk cannabis use guidelines in terms of the advice that I was giving them. And if they're not able to follow those guidelines to show that I've assessed for cannabis use disorder. I think when it comes to the ministry, if you feel that they have cannabis use disorder and it's uncontrolled, so it's affecting their functioning in any way, and they're not wishing to engage in treatment, that is a um, justification for reporting. I think that if you're able to start having dialogues with people about their cannabis use early on, then you actually have time to have the, the, the conversation around Ministry of Transportation reporting before you might need to do it. So there's this idea of like explaining to patients right now your use looks like this. If it was to become more daily use or become this or that, I'd be more concerned. These are the criteria for me in terms of my obligation to report. The earlier you can have these conversations, ideally out with the actual time when you might have to report, the better, because then the patient will feel like they might have slightly more control over an adverse event like reporting. Um, in terms of health insurance, I'm, I'm actually not sure. I think that you just have to you just have to assess and document and practice and provide care the way that you feel comfortable with. Um, the health insurance piece, they'll probably have their own criteria for assessing. So is there a difference in impairment for driving with smoking cannabis and just using THC oil? THC oil. Um, I'm not sure. I think probably it would still be six hours. I'm just going to go back to that lower risk slide. I mean, it does say here the wait time may need to be longer depending on the user and the properties of the specific cannabis product used. 
So I think what they're saying is it should be at least six hours. I would be recommending patients to try the products or the different products at home when they're not planning on driving and actually have them assess how they feel they're functioning after six hours or eight hours or 12 hours and have them involved to some extent in how they're assessing the duration of its action. But I would try and do that before they actually are driving because there is a great deal of variability from person to person as well. So do you have any suggestions on NRT when client is using both tobacco and cannabis? Um, you mean would you need to adjust the dose? It depends on how they're using the cannabis. If they're using cannabis with tobacco, um, then you would have to include that in your assessment of their tobacco use disorder and provide nicotine replacement therapy according to like their total ingestion of, of tobacco or nicotine, if you like. Um, I think that you can treat uh, tobacco use disorder with nicotine replacement therapy and still um, manage cannabis use disorder as well, as long as they're not using tobacco-containing products. What There's might the anticipated signs and symptoms of withdrawal in an acute setting, acute care setting be? Should we consider treating inpatients acutely for withdrawal symptoms? And if so, what would the timeline be? That's a good question. Um, so there's no, I work in the medical withdrawal unit at CAMH. We don't routinely admit people for uh, cannabis use disorder. The client I spoke about, it was really to break the cycle of use. So we actually, we, we tried Navalone, but he was actually okay sometimes without it. There's no specific medical management for withdrawal. You could try Navalone, but it doesn't need to be done in an inpatient setting. The majority of withdrawal symptoms from cannabis are, are more psychological. There are gastrointestinal side effects for sure, and people can experience anxiety, insomnia. Um, there tends to be a bit of a delayed onset in terms of withdrawal symptoms, so people might not start to experience more intense withdrawal for two to three days. So if you were going to um, recommend or sort of placing them in an inpatient setting, so a setting where it was more difficult for them to actually access the cannabis and you thought that was going to be therapeutic, I would say probably five to seven days would be reasonable. Um, but it doesn't have to be a medical setting per se. There's no life-threatening risks from cannabis withdrawal. So we have another question. This was asked earlier. Why is it important to use pharma pharmacological therapies before cannabis for pain? Oh, before dry cannabis? I think it's because we understand, we can speak more confidently, confidently to the pharmacology and the, uh, the duration of action, onset of action, when it's um, pharmaceutical products. So in Avalon, we can say, you know, this is, we, we understand the pharmacology, pharmacokinetics. Same with Nabiximol. I think with um, medical marijuana products, it's a little bit more unpredictable, and it, so I think that's why. Are there screening tools in place in the community that officers are using to test for driving under the influence, such as a breathalyzer for alcohol? Um, I don't think so. Um, I think that they are wanting to do blood tests but people can actually decline that. There's no, as, as far as I'm aware, there's no screening test that you can do on the road, like on the roadside when you stop people. And that's one of the things that's going to make it a bit complicated to work out how to work out if somebody's impaired or not. I think that's an area that's being looked at. 
Are there recommended ask advise guidelines for cannabis use similar to tobacco and the frequency of asking? Um, I don't think there's specific ask guidelines. I would say if it was myself. Um, so if you are asking about cannabis use and you're not too concerned about it, I think you would probably look at it as how often are you going to ask about other substance use, like how often do you check in with somebody about their alcohol use. So it would at least be once a year an annual physical. If you've identified some flags around their cannabis use, I think I'd be wanting to ask every three months or so. And if you've actually identified that, that there is a problem, I would be following up at least every month. So if someone has abused cannabis before, would you still recommend medical cannabis for treatment? Um, so if, if, if you, the, the guidelines right now from the College of Family Physicians are saying that, that I, I believe that's a relative contraindication. I think that I would be looking at is there cannabis use disorder in remission? So is it being sustained remission, i.e. for more than a year? And I would be looking at the, all the other stability factors. So do they have any, their cannabis use disorder might be okay, but do they have some other active substance use disorder now or uh, concurrent mental health disorder that's destabilizing? So what you're assessing is um, the cannabis use disorder history and also their overall clinical and functional stability. So I don't think it's an absolute no, but I, I would not, uh, I would hesitate to do it, certainly, in somebody who has active cannabis use disorder. And it would have to be a thoughtful process for somebody with a history with a clearly documented rationale as to why, why you're doing it. So other options have been tried and they've, not, they've been suboptimally effective, that you're trying this and you're going to reassess in a month or whenever you're going to keep reassessing to make sure it is effective and it doesn't put them at risk of of developing problematic cannabis use again. Thank you. Are prescribing physicians mandated to provide employers of patients using cannabis who are using heavy machinery and driving? So would you have to inform uh, the employers of a person's cannabis use if they drive heavy machinery? Would I have to? Just prescribing um, physicians, are they mandated to? I don't think we're mandated to. Um, I would be strongly encouraging the patient to do that. Um, I think our main obligation is to the Ministry of Transportation. Um, so any vehicles that you would be using at work, that would come under the realm of the Ministry of Transportation. But heavy machinery, I don't think that we're under obligation. Although it would certainly ca cause some moral distress, I think, if you knew that somebody was operating heavy machinery and wasn't disclosing. Do you mind speaking on the health effects of cannabis secondhand smoke? Oh. Um, so it would be the same as uh, the health effects of cigarette smoke in terms of if they're using um, tobacco containing products, so anything that you're using when you smoke it is similar to the toxins that you would use in cigarettes. All the same rules would apply. Um, in terms of actually inhaling cannabis, um, my understanding is that right now we don't have specific concerns about secondhand um, inhaled use. But again, that's something that I could look into in more detail and see if I can find anything interesting in the literature. How often do young adults see their family physicians? So how likely will they be to tell their family physicians that they use marijuana? It's a good question. Um, I think with young people, you have to take any opportunity you can get. <laughs> um, 
I would just be opportunistic. So if it depends how you run your practice as well. Like you might try and normalize that with young people you want to see them at this age or that age, like certain ages that you decide are more important if they're not coming in every year. Um, I think that certainly from the age of 14, 15 and above, I would be at least wanting to check in once because use that starts around that age is, is more significant. What are your recommendations for job interviewers during the interview for use of cannabis? <laughs> um, well, that's, a, uh, that's a tough question. What do people, I mean, what do job interviewers, do they ask about other substance use? Uh, I don't know what would be deemed acceptable in terms of not being intrusive about their medical history. I'm not sure about the answer to that question. I think basically I would be careful that you're not seen to be discriminating in any way. Um, if the job has some sort of occupational health component, assessment to it, then that would be a better way probably to assess for that piece. Thank you. And we just have time for a few more questions. So if your question has not been answered yet, uh, do you mind just re-putting it into the discussion box? Um, for the next question, we have what risks to privacy will be involved with the collection of saliva to detect marijuana use? Right, because that is a roadside test that they're doing. Um, I just uh, I just remembered that after the question. What was the sorry? What was the question about the saliva testing? What risks to privacy will be involved with the collection of saliva to detect marijuana use? Um, it's a good question. It depends on how it's collected and who the information is shared with. Um, I think that you should be able to consent to the procedure. So um, in consenting to the procedure, it should be explained to you what will be done with the result, how the result's going to be used. But I think that this area, so what the police can test for, roadside testing, um, is something that I will look into in the research and, and post some stuff on the website. Because I see some of the responders have referenced the roadside saliva testing. Is there any evidence of cannabis being used successfully as a measure of a harm reduction to get rid of other substances? Um, I, I think that there's some interest in looking at it to, uh, as a replacement, as a treatment for opiate use disorder. I'm not aware of any evidence that shows that it's effective for the treatment of other uh, substance use disorders. Um, so I think that that's an area of interest for research. But right now that we don't actually have any definitive answers in that respect. A lot of my clients are very interested in that because especially the opioid use disorder clients because they'd rather not be on suboxone or methadone. Um, but as far as I'm aware, we don't have any evidence of that right now. We have Windsor, Essex County Health Unit asking whether medical cannabis is predominantly higher levels of CBD. They are hearing conflicting information that some have higher THC, but they thought that CBD was the more therapeutic. CBD is the more therapeutic. So in the medical document that you would fill out um, that's approved by the Canadian family, the CFPC, um, it's, and then the guidelines, it's recommended that you ask for the THC component to be as low as possible. So as a follow-up, what percent of THC is considered low THC? Um, again, I, I don't know that I could say to you this is low and this is high. I think the lower the better. So. 
10 or 15 percent, um, I would say, are below, I would probably be aiming for. But I don't want to be too specific because I think the lower, you certainly want there to be uh, the proportion of THC to be less than cannabinoids. So I think with that, we will um, leave it with the questions. I would just like to thank you so much, Dr. DePola, for such an educational and, and informative webinar. And thank you to everyone who attended. The chat was so engaging. Um, I'm sorry we didn't have enough time to get through all the questions, but I will try and extract these and put together an FAQ document to distribute. Uh, this webinar has been recorded, and I will be distributing the slides and a link to the recording this afternoon so you can share it with your colleagues. And again, if you have missed today's presentation or if you are interested in viewing it again or you are interested in viewing previous webinars, including our first session of the Cannabis Webinar, a list of our archived webinars is found on our website so you can view them there. And thank you, everyone. Have a great week.